So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as uh, some of you are in a very different uh, time zones. I'm Isolina Boto. I work for uh, CoLACP as uh, head of uh, networks and alliances. I'm very pleased <clears throat> to welcome you, <clears throat> excuse me, this morning uh, for, for uh, our session on fruits and vegetables industry, market trends and prospects of a dynamic sector. Um, as you know, uh, the UN has declared this year, 2021, the International Year of Fruits and Vegetables to raise awareness of the nutritional and health benefits of consuming more fruits and vegetables. So it's, it's a core part of our work at ACP, of course, and also ECD and other partners, but we thought to take even more this opportunity uh, to uh, uh, support the sector and to promote discussions about the sector. So this, uh, this uh, series that we start today by the first session are aimed at uh, sharing knowledge of the markets and operators with a wider audience and just technical specialists that we deal uh, daily with to understand better the fruits and vegetable sector contribution to sustainable production and consumption to promote, of course, uh, uh, an increased uh, intake of fruits and vegetables as a way to contribute to healthier and nutritious diets and also to showcase successes and innovation from the private sector operators across countries and promote lessons learned. So today, the first session will give a very, very quick overview of uh, trade, the new markets, the structure of the industry, and some insights from policy, research, and industry. Uh, we consider that it's a vital sector, not only for foreign exchange, employment revenues, but also for the livelihoods of millions of smallholders, not only in Europe, but in Africa, Caribbean, Pacific, and other, and other parts of the world world. Uh, it has a potential for growth and reduction of poverty and many opportunities for youth and women in working in the sector. It is also a very dynamic sector with lots of changes in technology, um, te uh, techniques, logistics, etc., which we would like to learn from, including, uh, you know, for other sectors. Um, we want, of course, uh, to uh, promote, and that's a core part of uh, CoLACP work, work as well, food safety and certifications, uh, as well as, of course, all the, uh, the safety, safety of food, which is critical now. Uh, we want to look at the uh, trends between local sourcing and exports, and of course, the potential for e-commerce and other new um, uh, opportunities, online opportunities. So having said that, we have an exciting panel today, uh, many uh, different uh, perspectives and views. I encourage you to post, of course, comments, contributions in the chat. Um, and uh, for some of them, some of our speakers could uh, respond directly. And if not, we will take in the, in the um, uh, question and answer session. So without a major delay, and thanking you all for being with us today from very, very different parts uh, of the world, I would give the floor to Jeremy Knobs, General Delegate of the CoLACP. Uh, he is, of course, our General Delegate, but also an expert on private sector development with lots of experience in the EU, in the US, Latin America, and Africa, a very strong uh, knowledge and back background on private standards and certification, specifically for African, Pacific, and Caribbean producers and exporters of fruits and vegetables. So please, Jeremy, could you give us some of your insights in five minutes? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Isolina. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good, good evening uh, to, to everybody, uh, of course, to, to participants, um, and also to to panelists, fellow panelists. I welcome you all, of course, to, um, to this first joint event with the OECD. So uh, a special thanks, of course, to, uh, to the OECD for, for organizing, uh, um, the, as, as Isolina said, um, th this first event, which is aimed at, at uh, initiating a, a, a series um, within the framework of, of the International Year of Fruit and, fruit and Veg. Specifically with regards to ACD, CoLACP has been a member for many years now of, uh, uh, of, of the fruit and veg uh, scheme. And, and, and of course, we've benefited substantially from, uh, from the information, knowledge uh, shared within the group. Um, and, and, and really, um, I'm, what I'm going to do in, in a couple of minutes now is, is to uh, 
just remind who, who we are uh, as CoECP, an, an organization, um, and, and explain why, why uh, we, we're moving progressively to um, increasing our efforts in, in better understanding uh, the sector. Um, now, so CoECP, uh, we, we are a private sector association, uh, not for profit. Our members, uh, the majority of our, of our members are, are companies um, active in the, in the production, processing, trading, exports or imports of, of fruit and veg, uh, both fresh and processed. Um, they're all located throughout Africa, Caribbean, Pacific countries, uh, but also uh, in the EU. And they're all committed and, and share overall the, the same mission uh, of, of supporting uh, sustainable and inclusive production and trade of, of fruit and veg on domestic, regional, and international uh, markets. The, the, the association um, in itself, um, I would say, and, and, and this has been uh, increased um, in the past 20 years, because the association has quite a long, long history. It was created in, 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 in the 70s, really initially to uh, foster trade between ACP countries and the EU of, of fruit and veg. Uh, but, uh, but as I mentioned, uh, today our mission go goes beyond, I would say, exclusively uh, these export trade flows uh, by looking into uh, these trade flows uh, taking place at domestic and, and regional level, simply because it's the reality of our members. And, and that's where uh, some of the major evolutions are, are, are taking place in terms, of, uh, in terms of market dynamics. Well, I'd say that beyond uh, this role of, as an association, uh, during the past 20 years, um, in recognition, as, as Isolina highlighted, uh, in recognition of the importance of the sector um, in, in, in contributing to several sustainable development goals, uh, poverty reduction, food security and nutrition, but also environmental protection and, and others. Um, so thanks uh, to, to, through this recognition, and, and thanks, of course, to the support of, of international uh, uh, donors such as the EU and, and, and specifically the Organization of the African Caribbean Pacific States. Um, we also uh, we have also become a, a technical assistance tool. Well, of course, with the EU and the OECPS, but also with other uh, with other uh, donors. And um, we 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 I would say our, our activities uh, on on a daily basis are are are, are a lot about managing individual individual uh, capacity strengthening projects, um, close to, to age 150 uh, as, as of today, um, individual uh, capacity strengthening projects uh, throughout Africa, Caribbean, Pacific countries with, with a range of, uh, uh, of entities, um, from cooperatives, um, larger MSMEs, but also with competent authorities, uh, professional associations, training institutes. Um, and the, the, uh, the topics uh, that we've been working on have, have, have also evolved and, and uh, really started by, by being extremely focused uh, say on overall uh, sanitary, in fact, sanitary compliance to progressively uh, move. Of course, we still uh, very much work on, on those aspects of food, food safety and plant health, uh, but, but also increasingly uh, in areas such as social empowerment, environmental protection, and, and business development uh, with, with the ultimate objective of, of facilitating access to, uh, to finance. The, the, the key uh, intake uh, from, from, from these different topics has been to uh, facilitate uh, access, access to markets. It's about facilitating access to markets and supporting operators uh, throughout ACP countries and, and, and in the EU uh, to, to have this uh, uh, increased capacity to, to, to access markets. And, and on the how, it's been on focusing on, on the human capital side. Now, instead of focusing on human capital, it, it comes down to uh, basically on, 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 on a daily basis, uh, supporting all operators and all types of uh, persons in charge of uh, making uh, decisions on a daily basis to be able to make better and, and informed decisions. In that sense, in, in a sector that, that has evolved uh, quite, quite a lot during the past decades, and, and this evolution is, is accelerating, of course, with some macro evolutions of, of the economy, um, we realized at CoECP that we had to uh, revamp and, and put more efforts 
into understanding some of the uh, key uh, trends and trade flows taking place, not only from an export uh, perspective between ACP countries and the EU, but also uh, between ACP countries themselves uh, being on an intra interregional level uh, or, or, or domestic level. And, and, and we've been doing that uh, through uh, uh, putting more resources, uh, thanks, of, of course, uh, to the support from, from uh, our, our two major intra ACP programs in our market intelligence departments. And since the past couple of years, we, we've been able to uh, uh, publish uh, uh, a number of, of market studies, and, and the latest will be uh, summarized uh, later on uh, over the course of, of today. One of our key challenges uh, today is um, making sure that the experience, the practices, the processes, the technologies that have been put in place now for a number of years, uh, more on, on the export side, on the export trade flows taking place from African and Caribbean Pacific countries towards the EU, are disseminated in the appropriate way, in the right way to also benefit production aimed at domestic and regional markets. And, and, and we're facing a huge challenge there, especially when looking at regions of the world, such as Sub-Saharan Africa, where there are still, uh, of course, uh, uh, major shortcomings in terms of food security and, and nutrition. And, and we, we feel that, that there's a huge, huge work uh, to be done. And I would say that, that today it's, it's one of our major challenges beyond, I would say, uh, purely uh, market opportunities and business development logics. There are, there are huge challenges here in terms of really uh, aiming at achieving the sustainable development goals by, by 2030. So to, to finish, uh, of course, as Elena said, we're we, we really committed uh, to, to pursue these, uh, these series, of course, with, with OECD, and, 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 but also with other partners. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an open, uh, open relationship um, and, 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 and really to make sure that we, we have the full understanding of what's taking place within the sector and, and that we continue to promote uh, the, the sector, uh, which, which clearly uh, and increasingly uh, is becoming uh, uh, crucial to, to the overall sustainability of our planet, as, uh, as recently highlighted by a number of studies published in the past couple of weeks about uh, dietary patterns and their environmental uh, impacts. So thank you, and again, welcome uh, to everybody. Uh, uh, we hope, of course, that you'll uh, fully enjoy and benefit from this event. Thank you very much, uh, Jeremy, for those words. So without major delay, I uh, now uh, welcome uh, Lee Ann Jackson, Head of Division, Agrofood Trade and Markets on the Trade and Agriculture Directorate at OECD, our partner in this series. Uh, Lee Ann, I'm very pleased that you could join today because I know that you were traveling and a very, very busy schedule, so very, very much appreciated. I have to highlight as well the excellent uh, working uh, technical uh, relations with your team, excellent team, and a uh, daily with Jose Brancilla and Marie Russell. Um, and uh, to introduce you in a few words, because you have done quite a lot, uh, you have more than 20 years of experience working in the area of trade and agriculture. Um, WTO, where you served as a secretary to the Committee on Agriculture, um, including in the multilateral negotiations, uh, you former life as well, and by the way, I read some of your papers, researcher at IFPRI, but also at in uh, universities in Australia and elsewhere. So I'm very, very pleased, uh, you know, that you could join us uh, for those uh, series and to give some insight as well as Jeremy in some of uh, your work on fruits and vegetables. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Iselina. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I know we're on kind of a tight schedule, so I'll keep my remarks relatively brief. But first to start, I just wanted to thank our partners, CoLSCP, for co-hosting this webinar. It's really a great opportunity to continue um, finding new ways to, to enhance our collaboration. The OECD Fruit and Vegetables team liaisons regularly, like you mentioned, with um, CoLSCP, and we really look forward to continuing this work. So um, as you said, I'm the head of a division at the OECD that's called the Agri-Food Trade and Markets Division. And the main goal of our division is to provide an evidence base and analysis to support governments in improving policy performance and also um, through that enabling the agricultural sector to, strive, to, to thrive. So I have three um, kind of strands of work that my team works on um, in that analytical capacity. So we do 10-year projections in collaborating with the FAO 
um, on agricultural commodity markets. And we publish every year an annual report that highlights what the trends, what we consider the trends in the future to be and unravels a bit how ag commodity markets, the system of markets might be affected um, if policies stay the way they are. Um, we also have a stream that's looking at agricultural trade and maybe in this respect, what might be interesting to this group is that we have some work going on related to sanitary and phytosanitary regulations and also approval procedures. Um, this is ongoing work right now, but we're, um, we're keeping, we keep a close eye on discussions that are happening at the WTO and try to find ways to pull together evidence and analysis that can support um, productive conversations in the um, WTO context. And then our third stream of work is on food systems where we are really looking at how, um, how food systems can help um, or how policies can help food systems deliver on three objectives, um, on sustainability, on livelihoods, and on delivering healthy food for a, a global population. So of course, I think all of these three analytical areas are relevant to discussions that you'll be having um, uh, today. So we, we monitor trends and developments in the agricultural sector, um, through our outlook and other work, um, the fruit and vegetable scheme aims to facilitate trade flows amongst member countries. So in a sense, it's really where the rubber hits the road. Um, as you know, over 100 billion US dollars of fresh fruit and vegetables are traded every year. And this trade has impacts on producers, on traders, and on consumers. And therefore, having clear and harmonized rules is really key to maintaining and enhancing um, trade flows. And we also know that traceability, or sorry, transparency and predictability can help policymakers take the right decisions to ensure staple food markets. And therefore, working in close cooperation with the private sector is also really essential to make sure that there's a healthy food chain at, glo at global and local, le local levels. So my colleagues, um, including Hubertus Gay, will provide more details of our work a bit later today. Um, so just to wrap up, I want to, again, thank you for the invitation to be part of this um, starting off the event. I'm thanking the speakers and all the participants. I'm really happy to formally launch the Fruits and Vegetables Industry Series um, by OECD and Colea CP, all, along with many other partners. And I'm wishing you um, great discussions today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Leanne. Very, very much appreciated. And we are looking uh, forward to strengthening uh, uh, the work with OECD and other partners. You mentioned FAO, of course, for the OECD uh, FAO Agriculture Outlook that you do, and I see uh, some of our colleagues, I see uh, notably Paola Vulcano uh, uh, among us and many uh, in the, in, among the participants coming from uh, FAO and partners. So without a major delay now, um, and continuing with uh, OECD experts, uh, Hubertus Gay is the Senior Agriculture Policy Analyst uh, in your team. Uh, he will uh, give us an overview uh, of global trends in trade and consumption. Uh, he is, of course, a researcher, commodity specialist. He, his previous work before joining OECD was at the European Commission, especially at uh, DG Agri, but also at the Joint Research Center. Uh, and of course, he's also uh, very much uh, interested uh, in agriculture from a, a small age, as his family underlines his family comes from that background that still runs uh, um, uh, a farm. So thank you very much for giving us briefly, because as I said, we will uh, come back in subsequent sessions to very, very specific markets and uh, uh, including some of the commodities. But thank you, Hubertus. The floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Isolina. And it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you for Color ACP to having me and uh, my colleagues at the Fruits and Vegetables Scheme at OECD. Yeah, and um, I will present uh, more generally about um, what is um, happening on agriculture markets in the next 10 years. But uh, to say my linkage is um, to the fruits and veg uh, is actually that my PhD was in uh, fruit trade or especially orange trade between South Africa and the European Union. So I have uh, some background in understanding the sector, understanding that the challenges beforehand, I also worked on a avocado farm uh, and looking at uh, some practical issues on this international trade. So got in some insight uh, into what's happening on the trade on fresh produce between um, Africa and the European Union. 
which is actually the focus of Color ACP. And, and so with that, then I can really link to what you're doing. Looking at my presentation, I will be more uh, general than very specific on fruits and veg. Just so that I can change the slides. Yes. So I will look a bit at the purpose of the um, agriculture outlook, give a bit um, highlights, and then interrupt uh, what we do in fruits and veg, because that's a bit difficult. Um, looking at the first thing, so the purpose is actually that it's not a forecast. So we don't say what will happen. It's more a planning instrument. So to plan a policy, to discuss, to see what are the interlinkages, where everything comes together. And we are always challenged. Uh, very often the comments are, uh, the next product you have to include is fruits and veg. But the problem is we are working on commodity basis on global balances. That means when we would include fruits and veg, uh, we have to see how to group fruits and veg. So having only a big group fruits or a big group veg is not sufficient. So we have to see how to group them. On the other hand, uh, there's the other issue that we are not only uh, would then cover fr um, fresh produce, but the whole produce change, and then we get differences. And but that's the same what we have in, in other products. When you look at other products here, how we cover and how we look at, at elements is very often the food consumption, and that is not only not only the direct food consumption, which is in fruits and veg um, sometimes very important for the fresh trade is actually only a share of what is used of the products. Very often large shares are used in the feed or fuel or even other uses. And so that's uh, where we have to see. So we want to cover the whole production and the whole consumption and not only a segment like fresh produce. And there is why we are still in discussion how to cover better fruits and veg. Um, looking at the importance of countries in the consumption, we see really a shift more and more towards low and middle income countries. They are driving the global demand. The low income countries mainly because of population growth and the middle income countries because of a shifting of diets, moving the diets towards uh, new products, increasing the diets per person. Whereas on the developed countries in the, in the OECD mainly, the shifts are very minimal because there's less population growth and the dynamics of changing diets is much slower. Sometimes there's some substitution, but generally the drive for the global markets, and that will be also more and more the case for the fresh produce markets, in fresh air fruits and veg are coming from um, the low and middle income countries. Still, the high-income uh, countries are a good market and remain a good market, but the drive comes from there. When you look at, at the diet pattern, and then uh, that's one of the elements, as it's a year of fruits and veg, we covered a bit and wanted to look a bit at fruits and veg, we see that only 6%, 6 to 7% of global calories it intake come from uh, vegetable and fruits. And there are some regions like Asia and Northeast, uh, uh, Near East and uh, North Africa, where it's higher, but also parts where it's actually lower the intake, lower share intake, lower total uh, calories per person per day coming from fruits and veg. And this is actually for a high, healthy diet, this should be promoted more. And there's a challenge how to push that one forward and get that one more on the sector. There we are only have historic data, mainly based on FAO data, and that uh, shows where the challenge is. Looking at some of where the production is moving, for the general production, it's moving out of more land into production. It's much more productivity growth. One is the multi-cropping, and I think the multi-cropping, especially also for fruits and veg, is important. You have several harvests per year, and uh, use the land much more intensive. And then in addition, also the yields are contributing much more. So actually new land is very little coming globally into the production of, in this type, it's um, arable crops. In, in fruits and veg, there's more flexibility, but generally 
the growth in production is coming via yields and via more intensive or multi-crop use of farmland or also in, in the terms of more intensive use of greenhouses and so on and not getting more and more um, area into production. Looking at trade side, it is like um, what we always present and inform people, and that's for all. This also includes fruits and veg, and an assumption is like 20% of all calories we consume has crossed the border. That means that trade is vital for food security, biodiversity, also for uh, livelihood of farmers, because there's a big earning, there's lots of products are moving across borders. It's not only fruits and veg, in fruits and veg, it's mainly the fresh produce. In other products, it's, uh, it's also processed products. And they are moving and crossing borders. And that's why trade is vital. And in functioning trade is important. And there is where COLA, ACP, and the fruits and vegetables in play a role to enable trade and promote trade between different regions. Looking at um, some products, and we have for tropical fruits a section in our in our report. And there we see how dynamic the growth, especially in avocado and also in mango is, has been over the last uh, 20 years and also is expected to remain a dynamic market globally. Other markets like papaya, because of the more difficulty to transport is less dynamic. And also pineapple is less dynamic in international trade than those more hot kids on the block, which are and um, have also to push um, in the demand as being healthy, being um, a bit hyped also at the moment uh, to uh, promote. And there you see dynamics, and that's very often more dynamic than the global picture of trade. Looking at the prices, and there we see somehow a pressure downwards, and um, generally because we have lots of productivity growth and um, the growth and overall consumption of food is limited. The population growth is slowing down globally. In addition, more and more countries have a quite high intake of calories. This could be a bit different for fruits and veg, as fruits and veg trying to get and is, are promoted to have a higher share in the overall diet. So what we see in, in France um, in this data, it's coming from the fruits and veg scheme, there's actually the prices are actually more dynamic in the fruits and veg sector and the fresh sector than the overall food product sector. So there's more increasing prices than generally. But when you see on the COVID impacts on this market, that also promoted the prices because it was more difficult to get products from the producers to the consumers because of movement restriction higher transport costs, we still see it that the container costs are higher. The seasonal workers sometimes could not move across borders um, and that limited some of uh, production and, and the movement of goods. And of course, that shifted all the orientation a bit for, for temp, uh, away from some of the um, uh, restaurant sector, also to internet sales. The question is how some of the fruits and vegetables sector can benefit and contribute to that part and see how long living this trend is, but it's um, still an important part. And as lots of restaurant trade went away, that's important to stay. And with that one, I gave a bit of an uh, overview, crossing lots of parts, and I'm open for questions. And thank you very much. Thank you um, very much, uh, Hubertus, for this presentation and for highlighting, uh, yes, the absolutely trade uh, component. We will uh, come back to some of that uh, later. Um, without uh, just to complement uh, that um, uh, presentation and with a focus on uh, ACP, so Africa, Caribbean, Pacific trade with the EU and the opportunities that the EU market uh, and some challenges, of course, but still opportunities uh, from EU uh, markets present to those uh, countries. <clears throat> a group of key countries for uh, uh, call ACP, as Jeremy has mentioned it. Uh, Emmanuel Borsolet, my colleague from uh, um, uh, Business Intelligence Unit, uh, Engagement and Marketing Lead, 
uh, we'll share some uh, quick um, highlights. Emmanuel is an agri-development engineer and economist specialized in agriculture and food systems. Uh, he is uh, very, very um, attached and uh, very knowledgeable about the sub-Saharan Africa and the EU uh, on agriculture, economic and development issues involving the private sector. So Emmanuel, thank you very much uh, for being um, with us and for sharing uh, some of the very recent uh, studies uh, from COLACP on those regions. You have the floor. Thank you, Isolina. Uh, I'm going to speak in French. Je vais parler en, en français. Et, et tout d'abord, je, je salue uh, tous les participants, les partenaires nombreux de cette... Uh, I'm going to speak French. I would like to welcome the participants, the many participants in this um, event. I would like to welcome the very strong partnership with the OECD and all their representatives. Uh, I see there are many countries represented with us today, so good morning to you all. I'm going to share in a few minutes the main results of a survey that was carried out by the intelligence market of the Colia CP. It was published in 2021, and it, it is a reflection of uh, the work, the result of that study. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. Perfect. Actually, it is a study of the European market of fresh fruit and veg, which is an update of work we had carried out in 2017. We, are, we have been trying to go further in this study as compared to what we did in 2017. I'm going to present two main results. First of all, the main trends that have been identified on the European Union market in the field of fruit and veg. Many of you already know those trends. And then in the second stage, and very quickly, I am going to focus much more on the market segment that much in which the fruit and veg exported by the European Union fit. Um, well, those exported in the um, African, Caribbean and Pacific countries, those countries where Colia CP is very active. So there are opportunities, uh, of market opportunities in the European Union, but there are also threats, we will, which we will see later. The opportunities are the increased consumption of fruit and vegetables, which has been uh, growing for a few years at the European level, which makes us believe in further growth in the future. On the whole, European consumers are still under the threshold recommended, the nutritional threshold recommended by the World Health Organization. So, fresh food and veg are on the rise on the open market. Consumption is on the rise on the open market. So they, are, they have a very good status in terms of nutrition. They are uh, products which are easy to eat whether they are fresh or freshly cut. We have seen a growth in this specific trend of consumption during these last years. We have seen less the, 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 the decrease of the importance of meat products in our diet. We have seen people shifting towards more fresh produce and fruit and veg. So the new products emerging on the European Union respond to a specific trend, which creates the growth of the fruit and veg uh, market. Organic produce has also been growing we have seen a very strong growth of the consumption of organic fruit and veg. The opportunities are not only those positive consumption trends, it is all these opportunities also um, are also 
related with the very dynamic distribution um, operation. Fruit and veggies made, make shops uh, warmer. They improve the atmosphere. So there is a strong um, innovation trend. The, ma the, the distributors have been very dynamic and we believe in the continuation of this growth in the future. And the same happened online. What we had observed in 2017, 2018, we know that the online trade, even of fresh produce and even fruit and veg have been growing online. And they have a very good um, image. So they have a role to play in that trade. I would like to insist on the partnerships between supply chains. We see that certain markets are successful because there are very close partnerships between different stakeholders. For example, mango as a, for, as a product. Um, as a result of the pandemic, there has been a very, very close partnership between all the stakeholders of the supply chain, producers, transporters, distributors. And these partnerships have uh, given way to success stories, especially in 2020, which was a very difficult period because of the COVID pandemic. So there have been positive effects related to COVID because COVID has created logistical issues, of course, but on the consumption side, it has given more importance to food and European consumers have turned back to staples such as fruits and vegetables. So it has created new consumption opportunities to consume. Consumers are looking for more healthy produce and fruit and vegetable enjoy a very good reputation at that level. Of course, there are threats as well. Uh, those of you who are in the market know that the that it is a very competitive market, a lot of competition between the European Union and other countries of the world, especially the ACP countries, um, Southeast Asia, South Africa, are very dynamic and very competitive actors on the market. As it, Since it is an attractive market, it also attracts lots of uh, providers um, from all over the world. It is also a market which is constantly evolving in terms of requirements. As Jeremy said in his um, introductory presentation, access to the market is complex because there are regulatory requirements European regulatory requirements and also customer requirements. So it is a complex market, which can mean constraints for certain providers if they don't adapt to those constraints. Then two threats that we have identified thanks to the study. Well, the actors in the market, the players in the market know that. And it is the, the issue of packaging. Well, there are specific regulations about plastic nowadays. Um, there is a lot of research on the way, but for the future of the trade in fruit and veg, it is clear that packaging is a challenge. So it means um, investment. And another threat is the rise of low coverism, which cannot be neglected. Fruit and veg are very attractive among young people. But there is also um, a desire to consume more local produce, which could be a threat. So we see, nevertheless, that the market has been very dynamic for a number of years. Uh, très important, puisque là, on, a, on analyse une période sur une période de 10 ans. On peut voir que quand même, le marché est continuellement en croissance en ce qui, en ce qui concerne les volumes de fruits et légumes. Et si on part 
en valeur, la croissance, le taux de croissance est encore plus important. Ce qui montre l'attractivité du marché pour les fournisseurs, c'est-à-dire qu'ils croient, là on est en valeur constante, ils croient plus vite en valeur qu'en volume, ce qui, ce qui nous permet de confirmer que ce marché reste attractif. Vous verrez dans l'étude, si vous la consultez, qu'il y a une analyse, là c'est, je parle global, par chaîne de valeur. Je vais y revenir rapidement maintenant pour vous donner les principaux résultats sur les différents fruits et légumes qui sont produits et exportés vers le marché européen par les pays ACP. Ce qu'on constate, en fait, ce graphique-là est assez intéressant parce qu'il montre les taux de croissance comparés entre les importations de tous fournisseurs de l'Europe par rapport aux fruits et légumes correspondants, c'est en jaune, et le taux de croissance annuel cette fois-ci pour les mêmes produits importés pour les ACP. Donc, on voit que les ACP, sur certains segments de marché, sont plus dynamiques que les autres fournisseurs. Sur d'autres, l'exemple le plus connu, c'est l'ananas. Ça, c'est historique. On sait que c'est l'Amérique centrale qui a pris la place sur le marché européen. Mais sur d'autres segments de marché, et on va pouvoir y revenir, on peut voir que les ACP sont, et l'Afrique notamment, de l'Ouest et de l'Est, sont dynamiques. Voilà. Ce graphique-là, c'est le même, mais on l'a rapproché, si vous voulez, puisque juste avant, on parlait juste de croissance annuelle. Là, on a rapproché par rapport au volume de marché. Il est clair que quand on parle de la banane, où on parle de la papaye, ce ne sont pas les, vol les mêmes volumes qui sont, euh, qui sont concernés. Ce qui fait que, euh, je regarde juste le temps, oui, je vais accélérer pour terminer. Euh, ce qui veut dire que quand on rapproche là, on voit certaines en fait, filières qui ressortent très fort, c'est-à-dire euh, qui connaissent des taux de croissance forts et qui correspondent à des volumes de plus en plus importants. On retrouve ce qui était cité par le CDE, l'avocat et la mangue, vous voyez en tête, derrière le marché, même s'il est difficile en termes de valorisation des produits, quand on ne parle pas de bio, de la banane. Derrière, vous avez l'avocat et la mangue qui constituent des grandes filières, et on le sait bien à travers notre quotidien, parce qu'on accompagne beaucoup d'entreprises dans ces secteurs-là. Et puis, il y a d'autres filières qui émergent, le maïs doux, la pastèque, le melon. C'est notamment lié à une dynamisation des, des exportations en provenance du Sénégal. Voilà, vous verrez qu'à la fin de l'étude, il y a une liste plus détaillée euh, et classifiée en fait, par type de dynamique, on va dire, de segments de marché qu'on a identifié à l'issue de l'analyse qualitative et quantitative. Vous avez le niveau 1, les principaux segments de marché en développement. Vous avez au niveau 2, des niches qu'on a identifiées comme de nouvelles variétés d'avocats où on croit en potentiel. Ou des niches qui ont été identifiées comme des segments de marché. Et le numéro 3, Um, we have uh, uh, different uh, sectors like uh, litchi, orange, uh, green beans, plantain, and banana and pineapple, where the market dynamics is uh, uh, quite uh, important and it's all based on the different value chains. Uh, as a conclusion, what I would say is that uh, coming from this uh, European market study, the European market is obviously demanding and highly competitive competitive and nevertheless uh, for uh, the European market. Uh, this uh, market study has been achieved by Decolle ABC. It is available in French and English. And if you want more uh, information, please uh, do not hesitate in contacting me or in contacting the marketing section. I would like to uh, to uh, thank the marketing uh, section at Colle ACP because this is one of a uh, series of surveys that are the result of a teamwork. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and I wish you a good work. I'm finished. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Azolina. Apologies for that English uh, interpretation, but I think that it's uh, back now. Um, so without major delay, we have to uh, uh, just uh, get on and then we will have a bit more time for the questions. And I invite you again to check some of those in the question answer as well as in the chat. Uh, uh, having uh, had this introduction and overview, let's move on now on a very, very uh, critical part and it's related to some of the questions as well on the role of the private sector um, and, and the policy and regulation on the organization of the fruits and vegetable sector. Uh, how the organization of actors is very important to facilitate trade 
and reduce technical barriers and of course increase efficiency. For example, applying common standards as well as being organized as uh, the industry sector. So Marie Russell from OECD, and this is our uh, colleagues from the fruits and vegetable schemes working on quality and marketing standards, will give you a brief uh, presentation. Um, she is um, working at OECD currently. Uh, previously, she was working at CNRS, so the French National Center for Scientific Research, as well as ISRA, INRA, uh, the French National Institute for Agricultural Research uh, in the fields of uh, sustainability resilience, agriculture, and food systems. And thank you very much again uh, to you and Jose for the collaboration. Marie, please. Thank you, Isolina, and uh, good morning, good day, good afternoon, good evening to all uh, our uh, participants, panelists, and, and attendees. Well, yes, uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, Isolina. I'm an old friend of fruit and veg, just to, as a joke, let you know that uh, uh, after studying uh, food sciences, uh, current technologies uh, for food industry in France, I focused, I made a, I prepared a thesis uh, on uh, the preservation techniques of fruit in Greek or Roman, Roman times, Greek or Roman times. So I made some jams with, uh, with antique recipes and uh, to go, that is, that was uh, the beginning of my, uh, my, uh, working life and now I'm, I'm glad to to have the ability to to serve at OECD because we are at OECD we are making uh, connections we are liaising people we are making links and uh, I think that's important to keep uh, open-minded on uh, any any kind of uh, of domains of uh, sorry yes of domains so well first of all um, I will share my screen, sorry, not done yet. Up. So I'm here to talk about the OECD fruit and vegetable scheme and the advantages of applying common standards. Uh, well, during this brief presentation, I will give an overview of the schemes, uh, our mandate, our activities, and the last slide that you, you can certainly download from the the ACP website will be the summary of the key messages. So what is the OECD fruit and vegetable scheme? Um, this, uh, this scheme hosted at OECD was funded in 1962 and uh, it is, uh, the membership uh, is, goes beyond the big OECD membership. I mean that uh, it is a self-financing scheme so we have members uh, from uh, from uh, Europe of course from the OECD uh, organization we, we also have non OECD members members from uh, Africa like South Africa uh, you can see the, the flags here um, like Kenya we have also New Zealand Israel who is a member of OECD of course but well I mean non OECD and but uh, exporting countries who export fruit and veg to OECD. I'd like to follow up on uh, Hubertus Gay's uh, insight, highlight, sorry, that 20% of all calories cross the borders, including fruit and veg calories. Um, I mean, yes, uh, fruit and veg uh, trade, that's, uh, uh, there, there are borders, so uh, there are controls. And the mandates of the fruit and vegetable scheme is to facilitate uh, trade through the harmonization of implementation and interpretation of marketing standards. And when I say marketing standards, I say, I think of international marketing standards. So how does it work? I work, sorry, I, I go back one slide back just to clarify that uh, all our members, whichever the size, uh, they have the same voting rights. So we have 26 members and as a OECD organization, uh, we, wor we work with consensus and we, we also have invite observers like Colea CP as 
international organization is an observer and we also have observing countries, observer countries. Usually it is the first step before accessing to the scheme. So how does the scheme work? Uh, in fact, our members, they share um, a common framework for exports for, uh, for the, for the, uh, of they, they share, sorry, a common framework for the export quality inspection system. So we have standards, international standards, and uh, here at OECD, we, we, set, we set inspection methods and uh, uh, the fruit and veg that uh, are controlled through our methods are, are given a conformity certificate that will help cross the border. Um, on, um, here, I make a stop, a, a very brief break because uh, uh, I was suggested uh, an image, a sort of metaphor, and I would like to, to share it with you. Uh, imagine a traffic traffic light. So we, you have the green, you have the red and the, the yellow. So the green and the red, it's easy. So green, go, red, stop. When it is yellow or orange, what happens? The drivers, they may stop or they may not stop. It's a sort of uncertainty uh, area. And uh, sometimes uh, some, some, some drivers, they, they, they will go through the orange and there may be some, uh, or even when it is the red light and there may be accidents and it, has a, it affects the whole road, the whole chain of, of cars. So here we act as, a, we help to regulate this traffic so uh, we have traffic lights, red and, and green. It is the international standards. And uh, as OECD, the fruit and vegetable scheme, what we do is that we work on explanatory, on explanations of the standards. So we issue, uh, we are very well known for the explanatory brochures. And these explanatory brochures, they try to reduce the uncertainty and to help people have the same language and understand the same things uh, as regards uh, the prescriptions of the standards. Um, we do not set standards, but we uh, issue uh, interpretation and global interpretation and the harmonization of, of, uh, uh, of uh, inter uh, global, uh, uh, sorry, understanding of standards. And then we set inspection methods. These are something that is agreed between our members. And recently we, uh, we agreed on also some explanations of our in inspection methods. They, are, uh, they can be used for by our members, or, uh, but they are also widely used outside the scheme itself. And I will say a few words about capacity building at the end of this uh, presentation. So very quickly, our inspection methods. So the latest version is 2.13. And uh, so we have now some guidelines on quality inspection that will be online soon. To help our countries and beyond, not only our countries, understand better uh, how the system is organized for trading fruit and veg and what are the control bodies, we issue several uh, guidance documents. And uh, one of them very use, used beyond the scheme is the peer review. So it is a, not an audit, it is done on a non-adversarial non basis. And some at the, here you see that we have already 10 um, peer reviews issued and the latest one was done in Kenya. Everything is available on our website. Here I give you an example on the, on the right side, you have the latest published uh, uh, brochure of OECD, the new brochure, I mean, on uh, uh, root and tubercle vegetables that was uh, uh, online last year. So what is it precisely, these brochures? It is a sort of interpretation of the standards. And uh, we have uh, at least 33 of our these brochures. We recently uh, uh, put online uh, six uh, new uh, updates, I mean. And what I mean by this is that there, all the updates and all the brochures are freely available online. They are electronic versions that anyone uh, can, uh, can download, even if we also print hard copies for our members. So 
here I go very quickly on that because uh, this is really a big tool of the OECD fruit and vegetable scheme. And these brochures, they are used, they can be used by, for instance, quality inspectors, uh, of course, of uh, national agencies, but also in the private sector at each uh, step of the chain. So we have text and we, the most important is the pictures. So the text is this way. You have the, the standard text in blue and the uh, explanation interpretation in, uh, in black bold. Then we have photos. You, you will be able to see that uh, uh, where we have some special rules. For instance, this one, uh, this tomato, the photo is supposed to show all the defects on, the, on one side. So, I mean, when there is an inspector at the border and he inspects lots, he can based on, uh, on uh, our brochures to help, uh, uh, because this brochure is help him to make his de decision on, on accepting or not accepting uh, the produce. And when the produce comes with uh, an OECD certificate at the border, uh, there are agreement between the members, member countries of OECD to lighten the control process. On that last slide, I just would like to highlight that when you buy, and this is also to follow up on Mr. Boursolet's comment that packing, uh, packing, and uh, and the packing is a challenge, will be a challenge in the, fu in the future for fruit and veg, and also the country of origin could be a challenge. And uh, at uh, the standards, explain, explain. Uh, I mean, the international standards are also. Uh, uh, pro providing prescriptions on, on uh, packing and the country of origin. And here, just for your information, on the label, on the package, you can have, for instance, class one, class two, or extra class for produce. In fact, any produce can be traded, except some that could be rejected. But you see, uh, the standards, they establish classes so that uh, the produce is traded at the different prices also, but it is the produce is allowed to, 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 to be traded as long as he, is, uh, in a, he, comp he complies with the prescriptions for each class. And here, I just would like to say thank you to um, Cole ACP because OECD has a long, long tradition of uh, co-organizing uh, and promoting capacity building activities. And here you have a list of what we do. Uh, and we are currently working on an e-learning system with Cole ACP, where we, it would enable a lot of uh, users, not only our inspectors, but also farmers and other uh, stakeholders to uh, get used to uh, our tools. So, and uh, to conclude, I just would like to uh, recall that we are uh, working for with governments for the benefit of governments, farmers, and consumers. If you would like to have more information, please feel free to visit our website or to contact us at this uh, contact information. Sorry for being a bit too long and thank you, Isolina. And yes. thank you all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mary. You have a, a few uh, questions uh, that I invite you to look and uh, uh, keep it for the question answer service on the, uh, you know, uh, what kind of structures can be member of the fruit and vegetable scheme and how do you determine which commodities are prioritized in the development of standards. Without major delay and with big apologies, uh, Philippe Binar, General Delegate of Freshfell, because he had to delay the uh, important meeting with the European Commission to be with us. Um, uh, Philippe uh, has a very, very long uh, experience. The fresh fell, he will tell us in a minute, is the European Association representing the interest of the fresh fruit and vegetable sector. Uh, it incorporates more than 200 members, associations and companies across the fresh uh, produce supply chain from production down to retail. Uh, he's also the Secretary General of WAPA, the World Apple and Peer Association, uh, which has also a, a huge 
future membership and the Secretary General of Chafe, the Southern Hemisphere Association of Fresh Food Exporters. So uh, I expert on the topic. And uh, as well as I encourage you to follow um, through uh, social media in the website, the very, very interesting information uh, that Freshfell uh, produces. I'm a big fan actually of uh, your uh, information and uh, very, very useful and informative. Uh, Philippe? Well, that's a bit <laughs> too nice introduction, I must say, um, because I think also here has in the line of the discussion, uh, I think the the, the work that uh, we do is a collective work uh, with uh, all the sector. And I will try to explain because I think that was a little bit the objective of, uh, um, of this session is to understand how there is a need of networking between public authority uh, and private sector and um, how we manage to balance uh, what is a very uh, or a market with very high competition, but at the end, the, the, the need to work collectively to secure a good competitiveness for, for, for the sector. That's a bit how I see uh, the, the, the response to the, the question on, on the market trends and the need to have a, a dynamic uh, sector. And uh, I will therefore uh, try to help you to understand what we do uh, as an organization, we have been uh, in place for more than 20 years now. Uh, we celebrate, in fact, uh, uh, last uh, uh, September over 20 years of uh, uh, activity. Um, uh, and I think we, uh, being based in Brussels, of course, our uh, main mission is to be uh, the voice of the fruit and vegetable sector here in Brussels, but I, I think we also want to act as a platform because I think uh, in the sector there is a, a lot of things that we need to discuss which are not necessarily uh, regulatory driven. Uh, there are a lot of things that the sector can do um, uh, together. We are a membership driven organization, so we don't depend on uh, any uh, financial support. We, we do uh, get involved into some activity in research or in promotion, which uh, uh, which could help us in in developing some project. But basically, our organization is uh, its membership uh, uh, driven, uh, representing uh, all the different kind of uh, uh, sector representative. Um, and I think when we want to do uh, our activity. Um, and, and get our voice heard. Um, we are a relatively small organization compared to maybe other bigger uh, entities or compared maybe to American uh, organization, which depend also on, 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 on sponsorship for uh, making their voice uh, heard. Uh, here we are much more um, independent and straightforward. And I think there are uh, a need to have an horizontal cooperation and a vertical cooperation. The horizontal cooperation means that uh, I think it's important that uh, the voice of the fruit and vegetable sector is heard with the other partner. And I think we, we work very closely with organizations like Copa Cogeta, like uh, AREP, like Colea CP. Uh, but we try also to have uh, well, of course, in-house uh, partnership with other structures like SHAFE, like uh, the WCO for the World Citrus Organization or, the, or WAPA for the World Apple and Pear Organization. But we have also to, to, to discuss with other organizations like Food Drink Europe, which represent the agri-food processor, with CELCA, the agri-food uh, uh, trade. We have some relation with uh, Eurocommerce, the retail, and uh, there are other retail organizations also with crop protection organizations. So I think it's important that in this big uh, bubble where there are different interests, there are the corporate uh, interest of, uh, of sector, but there are also individual uh, interests which are represented by uh, consultancy or public affair company. Uh, there are uh, NGOs which make their voice heard, there are chamber of commerce. So I think it's, um, uh, it's very important that we network with all these organizations, but also from the public sector with uh, member states representation, with um, uh, the different um, mission of third country here in Brussels, uh, and all of this to make uh, uh, the best we can our 
uh, work towards the, the European Commission with our primary uh, target of uh, activity, but also uh, through the European uh, Parliament. And uh, beside that, uh, we have decided in the sector, and I think this is quite innovative, uh, to, a, uh, to have or to build a vertical cooperation uh, in the sector, uh, where all of our members are uh, represented in, in one big umbrella organization for the European grower, for the traders, the different segment of the traders, uh, which could be the, the importer, the wholesaler, the exporter, the shipper for intra-EU trade, uh, some of the logistic operator, and, and the retail chain. And by the way, our uh, president for the moment is a representative from, the, uh, from a retail chain from, from Germany. Uh, it's also int interesting to see that we work uh, as a triangle. Uh, let's say that uh, Freshfield will be on the top of the triangle, and we have two strong bases. One are the national organization that give us a, a political coverage and leverage, and then uh, individual company, which help us to get, to get, to get uh, a closer ac access to the reality of the of, of the business. And, and I think all of that make that uh, uh, we can try to make the difference. Uh, we cannot cover all the topics and therefore we have to be selective in what we do uh, in regard to agriculture policy, food and plant safety, trade, health and nutrition and sustainability. I think these are the, the major uh, area uh, where we try to be uh, active, to be sufficiently uh, strong in providing uh, let's say the operational experience, because I think we, we are living here in Brussels in a very political uh, environment. Uh, I think we, we need to have a political coverage, obviously, uh, but I think it's also important that we try to explain the specific of our sector, because when we, uh, we, we, we do that, when we talk about the product, and I think at the end, uh, the, the, the protagonists in our organization are not the national organization of the individual company. We try to make sure that the protagonist is the, the product. Uh, and when we talk about the product, we are in a better position, I think, to find a solution and to find um, a consensus about the solution that are needed for, for the sector. And when, when we look at uh, the, the, the big picture, I think we are at the end of quite an important sector. We, we should not be modest. Um, we, we represent uh, a sector where in the production, it's about 120, 125 million uh, tons, uh, out of which we have about 80 to 85 million tons of production, which go to the fresh market. Important to understand that uh, out of this volume, about 60% will remain in the member states where it is grown. So I think we are primarily, and uh, despite what uh, is often uh, depicted, uh, a, a, local, uh, a local business, but the local business need to be complemented and it need to be complemented by the intra-EU uh, exchange. So we have a very dynamic trade component in the EU. It's always a safe bank, uh, as we say it. Uh, and it needs to be complemented also by uh, the import, which come uh, from third country, uh, tropical product, counter-season product from the southern hemisphere, uh, additional product which extend the season from the Mediterranean basin. So I think we, uh, we work in the EU with more than 130 partners. And as it has been said, the, the, the import business has not declined. There are often questions about all the difficulty on the, uh, on, on the market access in, in, in Europe. But at the end, we have seen that the import have always known with a good partnership between the supplier and the importers and the distributor in Europe to uh, adapt and to respond to this uh, question. And the EU need also to be present on the, uh, on the external market. Uh, I used to say that 95% uh, of the consumer are outside the European Union. So we cannot disregard what is not happening uh, inside uh, or outside the EU. And we de facto export still to 145 destination. Uh, we had a big hit uh, in, um, in the export business with the Russian embargo, then with the Algerian embargo. I think all of this uh, mean that uh, 
we still need to uh, rebuild uh, a present on, on third country market, despite the, the general tendency today of the farm to fall that it's important to be local. We are already a local uh, business. And um, so I think this picture gives us an idea that we are at the end a local uh, business, but with a very important global uh, perspective. Uh, and we are uh, a job intensive uh, sector, which is a, a social component, uh, which is very important. And uh, economic wise, we are a business of around 200 billion euro. Uh, and if I come back a, a moment, uh, I think we, uh, I mentioned in the beginning that competition is very important. And in the competition, I think there are very positive elements of the competition, but I think we have also to be aware that we are competing with other agriculture products. Uh, from a, a budget perspective at the uh, Common Agriculture Policy, we are a relatively small supported uh, budget. We have only 3% of the budget. It's getting more and more complicated now with the evolution of the CAP to know exactly what is ending. But our best feeling uh, and, and estimate is that about 3% of the CAP budget end with uh, fruit and vegetables, uh, mainly with um, uh, the system of uh, producer organization and operational program. Uh, but there are other things like the school scheme, some of the budget coming from promotion policy, but uh, in a sector which contribute to roughly 20% of the agricultural value. So already there, we have an, an imbalance. And without making polemics with other sectors, we know that uh, uh, other sectors are also those who have the bigger challenge in uh, coping with CO2 emission. And these are also those that are more uh, supported by the CAP, as it has been demonstrated by uh, a report of the uh, Court of Auditor. Uh, we are competing with um, other agri-food sector. Uh, some of them being also uh, financed by the by the CAP, by the way, uh, and these sectors uh, are heavily branded. They have high margin, so it's not always easy. And sometimes also using the image of the fruit and vegetable sector. Uh, then we have to compete um, inside our sector. I think that's a natural uh, element, uh, which is good. Uh, developing for new variety. I think competition there is boosting quality. Uh, it's helping to have. Uh, uh, maybe a, a, a full assortment year round, uh, but there are also a lot of all the kind of uh, competition in terms of certification, in terms of packaging, in terms of branding, in terms of uh, origin. So I think all of that is part of the dynamic of the market. Uh, there is a, a competition to position the sector in all the possible segments, the retail, which is a classical one and the discount one, the grocery shop, the food service, which is a growing uh, segment, uh, one uh, of the segment which, uh, by the way, has been the most affected by the uh, COVID uh, situation. And I think we have to compete with uh, uh, any new technology which could help uh, extending the shelf life, uh, expand, uh, extending or improving the convenience, the taste, the texture, etc. Uh, so I think all of that is indicating that uh, we are living in a world where there are multiple reality, where there are no one size fit all. But um, I think despite this, it's important to remember that uh, we are in a sector where uh, we are dependent on market instability, depending on the season, depending on the climate, and more and more of the climate, uh, where uh, the climate can be impacting the supply or the demand. Uh, we therefore, we, are, we can be exposed to crisis management because despite being the most uh, uh, fantastic product and probably one of the sector uh, giving the least uh, number of concern, it's appeared then uh, into some of the NGO campaigns, some of the image that, that we are perceived as not being the right product in terms of pesticide residue, in terms of food loss on food weight. And most, most of these uh, elements are often uh, not correct uh, at all. But we are therefore always ready to be exposed to a crisis and we need collectively to be uh, there. Uh, I think it's important in a very diversified sector to uh, be able to follow market trends. I think uh, if we take uh, Apple or if we take oranges at the end, we could see that in each of these categories, there are different market reality uh, because there are different variety. Uh, the market for Gala is not the market for Golden or the market for some Clementines are not the same for some other uh, Satsuma or etc. So I think it's important in the sector to structure the information and the commission is doing that with the market observatory. Uh, it's important that we are 
collectively working uh, in this new this debate about contingency uh, planning for food security that the Commission is organizing in the farm to four uh, debate. And, uh, and I think we, are, we have a high collective value, uh, uh, both from a health and an, an environmental perspective, and this needs to be uh, handled. It's a collective uh, responsibility to, to value this. Uh, and therefore, we, have to, uh, we have to conclude. Sorry, yeah, Philippe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm uh, with my last uh, slide on the uh, collective uh, approach. Uh, I will just take a number of success stories uh, for, for Freshwell in terms of generic uh, promotion, in terms of communication in case of crisis. The COVID was a very good example also, uh, but we do a lot of other elements also on market access for exporting, for, uh, for marketing standard, uh, for food safety scheme, uh, plant health with the EFITO uh, project, and also now uh, putting it on uh, sustainability. Uh, LCA uh, methodology is very important to make sure that we can calculate the, 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 the footprint that we have in the, the sector. And that's my last slide. I think we have a fantastic product and we need uh, permanently to indicate that we are the highest value in terms of uh, health benefit and the lowest uh, in terms of uh, uh, environmental impact when we take these two pyramid. So I thank you very much for the time and the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very much appreciated. Very useful uh, uh, and insightful uh, uh, presentation is uh, just so little time and so many aspects of the industry, but it's very encouraging for the next sessions. Thank you, Philippe. So without major delay now, we have four operators uh, in this panel, uh, looking really at uh, growth in the industry from their perspective. Uh, some are uh, global, uh, really global players with a lot of experience, a lot uh, of things to uh, share. And uh, they could uh, tell us a bit on fresh and processed fruits and vegetables. What do they see as opportunities uh, for value chain actors and the recent trends? So Frédéric Rosseneux is the Corporate Business Development Manager at Greenyard Group. I'm sure you all know, and if not, you will discover a major global player in the fruits, vegetables, in all sectors, fresh, frozen, prepared. So thank you so much. I know it's also very, very busy uh, for you. And I thank you very, very much for being with us. Uh, also very uh, happy that you are a member, a very active member of Cole ACP as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Isolina, for those uh, kind uh, words. And uh, welcome uh, all of you to this, uh, to this session and, uh, and particularly on, on, on this uh, on this part of, of the session where I want to look with you on a couple of the uh, the market trends uh, we see happening a bit more in, in, in detail and, and how we uh, how we go about some of these uh, some of these trends um, um, given the time perspective I'm, I'm not going to waste too much time on presenting the company I think Isolina you made a, a great job of introducing ourselves uh, we indeed uh, quite a, a large a company mainly focuses uh, north northwestern Europe and uh, and the US in terms of market uh, where we operate, but of course we source our products uh, from uh, uh, from everywhere. So if we look at uh, how we uh, how we see the, the food and vegetable sector, uh, I think it maybe may have crossed uh, paths uh, before as well in, in previous presentation. Uh, but the first thing we, we always notice, we're indeed uh, operating in a fantastic sector with fantastic products, but we still see an underdeveloped uh, consumption of, of fruit and vegetables. Um, roughly, one could say it's about 50% of the recommended uh, amounts. And the recommended amounts may be varying from country to country, but, but it's a general uh, observation that it's uh, around 50% under what is uh, is being advised by various health uh, health authorities. Um, in turn, that uh, presents also a potential to reduce a rising societal cost uh, linked to obesity. And I've put there a graph on the right, and it's important to bear these things in mind because that underconsumption has a cost, has a, a health cost as well. Uh, we have this uh, study, the global burden of disease, uh, which was published in 2019, and I put here the picture for Belgium. Uh, but it states that the, the, because of the lack of consumption in food and vegetables, uh, we look at the, an annual loss of more than 50,000 healthy life years 
in, uh, in Belgium. And just to compare it for cigarettes, this is 500,000 uh, life years, which are lost annually. Um, so this is a considerable amount and one can put it into monetary terms as well, then it, uh, even if it's always difficult to compare life with, uh, uh, with, with, with a certain value on it, but it, it would come down to an annual cost of uh, more than 2 billion euro uh, for, Belgium, uh, for Belgium alone. So imagine the, the potential there. We locally see that there is increasing consciousness uh, and also actions by, uh, by public authorities. Uh, we already see this in awareness measures. Uh, and the, yeah, you have the triangle or other schemes which countries are using to really put forward the benefits of uh, fruit and vegetable to activate consumption there as well. We have uh, initiatives like the Nutri-Score, uh, which are, let's say, uh, nudging uh, consumers as well in the, in the right direction. That's on a part of awareness, but we also see, let's say, benefits, and I know it's controversial maybe for some, but uh, fiscal incentives, which may uh, help to fund some of uh, the other activities to incite people to eat more fruit and vegetables, whether that's through a sugar tax or other pricing policies. Uh, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of study work uh, already there. And then we are fortunate to see active intervention as well. We have the, the fantastic uh, European school food scheme, which was, uh, let's say, uh, I think I, I may uh, think that Freshfell has a great credit in, in having uh, supported uh, that, that scheme from, from day one and make sure that the European Union uh, made money available to make it, uh, to make it happen. Uh, but on the other side, also uh, measures from uh, authorities to ban uh, sugary drinks and, uh, and chocolate bars and so on from, uh, from school grounds. Well, we could see, and, and that's an opinion we, we have as a company, but we still see, okay, despite all these interventions, we're not there yet. So maybe more could be done to incite also low-income households, because we see often that there uh, are the, the consumers which are typically uh, buying less. On average, you see that uh, often the, the heavy buyers, as we call the 20% of the fruit and vegetable buyers, buy almost half of the total uh, volume of, uh, of fruit and vegetables. Whereas if you look at the right side, uh, the light buyers, that's 50% of the, of the buyers of food and vegetable, which only consume 20% of the volume. Uh, and these light buyers are typically low income uh, households where we only, not only see that consumption is low, but uh, if there is some decline, it's often within this uh, category. Uh, and I think there, and it's not often that we say it, but uh, we may also be looking at, at some of the uh, examples which is, uh, are happening in the USA. Uh, with the SNAP program, uh, so it's really an assistance program uh, looking at uh, how to boost nutrition with these categories and also particularly dedicated to women, infants and, uh, and children. So there's still uh, some ideas uh, for, for the future, also for public authorities to, to see, okay, how can we uh, move forward uh, on, that, uh, on that front? And of course, it's not suggesting that it's only for a government's task. We have our role to play uh, as well, but I'll come to, back to that at the end of the presentation. Now, what's the, the big benefit also within our sector? We don't we not only have a, a good uh, health credential, we have also have very good environmental credentials. And this has been uh, pictured very nicely by the Barilia Center for Food uh, and Nutrition, uh, which show that uh, not only are we very healthy, and but we're also a low environmental footprint. And the same goes actually for the products which are less healthy, which have a high environmental footprint. And then it's good to see that organizations, uh, NGOs like WWF, are advocating uh, actually increased consumption of fruit and vegetables uh, to really make sure that we, for instance, uh, achieve the, the Paris uh, Agreement targets in terms of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, because consuming more fruit and vegetables in the end will help us to reduce our, our carbon footprint as a family. So we don't only depend on what uh, the big governments are saying on how we should we reduce uh, uh, our carbon, uh, carbon emissions for industries and so on. No, we can do it uh, very practically every day by uh, consuming plant-based foods more and fruit and vegetables even, even more as a health uh, a benefit, uh, as having a health benefit as well. If we look at the, the prospects for our, our sectors, uh, there's still worldwide significant uh, growth in consumer spending on food and vegetables, uh, which is predicted. Um, overall, uh, that growth will mainly be in, in, in other continents uh, than, than Europe. 
uh, but still within Europe, there is uh, there is considerable growth still to to achieve as well. Uh, but the main growth uh, drivers there will be uh, rather population growth and also per capita uh, GDP growth, which is uh, helping to uh, to choose for healthier food uh, choices as well and being in, willing to spend uh, to spend some more money. If, if I'm taking it to a very practical example, looking at uh, the Netherlands, uh, how uh, the consumption uh, has been uh, has been evolving there. If, if you, you normalize it since 2015, we have seen food and vegetable sales grown about 4.4 percent annually, uh, while in term uh, the volume that growth was only 1.1 uh, percent. Uh, but that's more driven by more valuable items like uh, you know, we did touch upon and we will see it immediately uh, exotic foods which are getting more popular but which have a higher price tag so people tend to choose uh, other bulkier uh, fruit less uh, but also like uh, small um, let's say uh, uh, cherry tomatoes and, and other items which are also have a, a higher value or items like uh, like berries what has been uh, Quite uh, and it is of no surprise that COVID, uh, the lockdowns have dramatically increased uh, the retail sales during uh, 2020. Uh, as you see, that really that that increase is, is quite dramatic. Uh, but what is interesting to see, but you could almost say that the, the major impact of lockdown is is gently uh, easing and that there is a shift again more to food service opening again. But that even in the first half of this year, there was still a volume growth of 3.6% uh, uh, visible year on year. So it's on top of the growth we saw uh, last year. So that offers us uh, also, let's say, uh, hope for uh, continued increase. Uh, because if one thing is that COVID has also uh, changed the mindset of people about the importance of, of health and the importance of a healthy, uh, healthy diet. Um, on the fresh segment, I already mentioned there, the increasing sales is mostly driven by the valuable berries, exotics, and snack vegetables. And I'll put here just the, the numbers to put that in, in, in place uh, compared to other categories. Uh, so before uh, fruits like avocado, which is coming from uh, all over the world, but uh, in you know, less part from, uh, from Africa uh, as well. Uh, the, the potential there, if you see where the US is and compared uh, where the EU is, even if we have shown uh, significant growth, there is still a lot of potential there in the future. Then we look, because we operate as well in, in, uh, in the long fresh segment, uh, we look at, at in the frozen segment and in the canned segment, purely looking at, at the standard vegetables, consumption is either stagnant or, or declining, but even there we see growth uh, categories in terms of, uh, of frozen fruit. Uh, which uh, bank is banking on, on on the smoothie trend, but not not only not only that. It's, it's more uh, it's, it's getting more and more popular every year, and it is maybe also a way to incite uh, maybe some of the low income households which can which cannot afford the, the more expensive category to introduce them uh, in a way also through frozen uh, alternatives. Uh, the same on canned, uh, we see that the popularity of that segment is decreasing, but we see then the plant based food. Uh, offering opportunities in terms of uh, pulses, uh, chicken beans, uh, and, and all kinds of, uh, uh, of, of peas, which, uh, which can be used uh, to, to have a better diet, free, uh, meat-free, or at least change uh, having a, a meat-free alternative a couple of times in, in the week. So that's certainly an area we are, we're looking at. The convenience opportunity, one of the reasons why the consumption is still not where we, we want it to be is that it, it takes time, at least for some uh, fruit and vegetables, it takes time to, to prepare them. And we see obviously that the easier categories are, are getting more popular, but we also look at uh, ways to make it easier for uh, the consumer to, uh, to develop uh, their consumption. One element there is, is meal salads, which is growing. Sure, it, during COVID, it has a, a bit of a backlash. Um, a backseat, but uh, now it's 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 driving again. And an element where we've invested quite a lot of uh, of expertise, and we are expanding in, in markets is uh, is meal kits. Uh, so it's really a, a ready-made uh, meal uh, solution. So all the ingredients are there. People just need to uh, cook it at, at home, but they don't need to think about uh, which recipe or need to worry about. Yeah, but I won't be using to, I won't be able to use that entire. Uh, 
packaging from uh, tomatoes or something else. Uh, so, and that is really uh, growing very fast and has been continued, has continued to grow throughout the COVID uh, lockdowns as well. Where do we see still room for growth in consumption? Uh, is mostly looking at increasing the frequency. Uh, you see still a lot of people uh, are not consuming uh, fruit every, uh, every day. Uh, so there is uh, elements and also looking at consumption moments. If you look at uh, uh, here, the, the red arrow where it's uh, stating uh, vegetables, most of the vegetables are still solely eaten at, at dinner time and to a small extent and uh, um, during lunchtime. And there are certainly opportunities there to, to drive to more uh, in-between moments of, uh, of consumption. I'm aware of time. This is my uh, last uh, slide. Uh, just to picture some of, uh, of the innovation fronts on which we are playing um, to, to really uh, hope, making sure that the consumer gets uh, uh, the, the fruit and vegetables where he's looking after and which is also in, in uh, aligned with some of the societal trends we're seeing, uh, whereby sustainability is, is a number one. <laughs> Uh, priority and it's increasing on our agenda every day. In fact, we, we released our sustainability report just uh, just this morning. So I welcome you to, to have a look at, at that as well, which is definitely containing more details. But using more uh, wonky food and vegetables, looking at how we can drive down the, the food waste uh, in our, not only in our operations, but also looking with the farmer, and making sure that at least if he's uh, some fruits or vegetables which cannot be marketed, can we find other ways uh, to, to market that. And a good example there is at the, the right with the cauliflower uh, rice, which is basically uh, rest, uh, the, the cauliflower stem, which we uh, shred to pieces. And actually, if you, if you bake it, it, it looks like you're, uh, you're eating rice, uh, rice but it's, uh, it's actually uh, cauliflower, uh, which then is also in tune with certain uh, other societal trends in, in diet three, uh, which, uh, which prefer to avoid carbohydrates, uh, for instance. Convenience, I mentioned what's for dinner. I mentioned there the, the meal kits as well. We look at uh, making uh, fruit and vegetables ever more tastier, looking at new varieties, uh, whether that's on apples, berries, there's still uh, ways there to, to further improve. And making our products healthier, I think fruit and vegetables de facto are healthy, but uh, where we produce some sauces and soups, uh, or even uh, prepared uh, or coated vegetables, we make sure that they contain ever less uh, sugar and uh, salt. So this is just uh, taking a quick tour around uh, what we are seeing and what we are doing as a company to, uh, to play on some of these trends. Uh, I hand it back over to you, Isolina. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for a very uh, useful presentation, highlighting uh, the health, sustainability, as well as all the innovation parts. And actually, I was looking, I was reading this morning, or just released uh, Canada, in Canada, uh, a survey, why, you know, people did, don't eat enough uh, fruits and veg, etc. And one was price, two was too much work to prepare, and three, they don't know exactly how to cook it. So I think, uh, you know, with your presentation, they will have absolutely no problem in increasing uh, that part. So thank you very much. Um, without a major delay, we go to the next uh, private sector operator, Madame Taina Randria Rilala, Manager Quality and Sustainable Development at Le Cofruit, Madagascar. Um, very much a very high specialist uh, as well in uh, Le Cofruit is a supplier to European markets, uh, retail and industrial sectors. And uh, um, Ms. Taina has led the implementation of new standards within the company as the requirements, as it has been explained by uh, Frederick and others of European uh, customers, sorry, have evolved. So please, Taina, uh, you present presentation um, as a short as possible. Thank you very much. And for the participants, please put your questions. And for the speakers, please answer them in the interest of time as well. Taina. Uh, merci, Isolina. Donc, uh, uh, tout d'abord, donc je tiens à remercier le collier ACP. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Isolina. Please uh, allow me, first of all, to thank uh, Cole ACP to uh, give me the opportunity to share our experience. Um, 
Le Coffrui is uh, one of uh, the actors that are part and parcel of the uh, ba group Bazan, uh, producing dairy, uh, produce fruit, vegetables, and leather shoes also. Our business model is an integrated model starting from the production of raw material going on to processing to end in exports towards the European Union and mostly France. Now, in uh, a few quick words, we uh, show you here the dates uh, that uh, are important for the development of uh, Lego fruit. That has shown our commitment in the development of a um, value chain that is responsible and uh, uh, fair. You see here that uh, Lego fruit was uh, set up in eighty nine. In ninety three, we uh, constructed a plant. We started producing melon and gherkins, uh, which means that from the very beginning, we were aiming or targeting the European market. We uh, started the first uh, uh, harvest on uh, green beans in uh, 2007, and the first organic products uh, were harvested in 2010. We then diversified uh, organic asparagus production, and from 2011 onwards, we embarked on the um, FAIR uh, certification uh, program. In 2013, we uh, endorsed uh, the, BCS, uh, the BSCI uh, code uh, uh, ruling the um, employer-employee relationship and industrial conditions. And in 2017, we try to have our operating uh, processes uh, certified under ISO 14001. In 2020, we bought over a, a plant, LCA. I'd like to know where you see my presentation or not, because I've been told that uh, uh, my the slides uh, do not move. Um, Axel could do so for you if you uh, want. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Ah. Ok, vous pouvez passer au slide numéro 3, s'il vous plaît. Ok, donc voici la gamme de produits. Donc, nous so this is the range of uh, products that we are producing. The, um, the, the flagship uh, product is uh, green beans, uh, wax beans, uh, green and white asparagus, mini uh, leeks, and a uh, gherkins, extra fine uh, gherkins that are either preserved or uh, sold in uh, jars. And this uh, gives us a possibility to value a local uh, labor force uh, that allows us to uh, produce a high quality product, very savory, and uh, that also allows us to create many jobs in our different uh, plants. Uh, we have uh, hired at least a thousand people per uh, production site. Uh, today, if we were to uh, mention three main uh, leverage that stand for the uh, uh, success and uh, growth of our activity, we would uh, mention the following ones. And I would like to have uh, slurred slide four, please. Uh, the uh, leverage uh, uh, would be the following. We have got three, as I've said. First, uh, the agricultural uh, value chain that is responsible and uh, fair, we uh, invest regularly in our industrial uh, uh, plants and sustainable uh, development is at the core of our activity. First, uh, the uh, responsible and fair agricultural value chain, the uh, our raw materials uh, are acquired uh, through purchasing contracts with uh, 17,000 producers uh, working on uh, the high plateaus of Madagascar. We offer them a, a purchasing guarantee uh, through a contract uh, and uh, approximately five contracts per farmer. And I've told you we had more or less uh, 17,000 producers. We also have uh, uh, the 
equipment uh, supply or product supply such as fertilizers that are, are delivered uh, um, uh, to the farmers by a look of free. We also have uh, uh, 100 to 150 experts who are experts in uh, agricultural uh, practices and who support our farmers. And uh, through the farmers, we get natural compost, more or less 100 to 150,000 tons a year and we manage to harvest 10,000 tons a year be it in conventional agriculture or organic uh, produce that would be approximately a hundred uh, um, containers of uh, canned or preserved uh, produce Beside uh, the uh, contractual agricultural uh, model that we are applying, we uh, are working with uh, six integrated farms uh, uh, that cover approximately 200 hectares that are being uh, harvested. Uh, it is uh, a system that en enables us to test new varieties uh, to develop uh, uh, technical species that are more resilient to climate change. Uh, we uh, do technical tests that have to be uh, um, certified because before they can uh, be uh, marketed. And we still have a land reserve of more or less 250 uh, hectares of to grow asparagus that we do grow ourselves. Le deuxième levier, c'est nos investissements réguliers dans nos sites industriels. The second lever is our um, regular investments in our industrial sites. Since 2020, we have two industrial sites, one in Antananarivo, the capital city, and the other one in Antirabe. These two industrial sites are ISO certified, according to European standards. We regularly uh, invest in renewing um, um, industrial plant. We make sure we optimize the use of resources, mainly the water, the water which is becoming, water is becoming scarce, but these European certification standards um, enable us to reassure our customers as to the total traceability of our products from the crop to the fork and also to guarantee the um, health safety of our products. Now, the third lever is sustainable development. As I said earlier, we are a fully integrated system, which means that we systematically include in our value chain the farmer, the peasants, and the small producers, um, and uh, it is at the heart of our strategy, which is based on three main lines of action, the improvement of the well-being of our partners, small producers, with whom we make sure we establish a sustainable, transparent relationship in order to secure stable income to the farmers. And we make sure we have a win-win, we have win-win relationships with them. Then the second line of action consists in reducing our environmental aspect. We try to make sure we use natural resources reasonably. And it is related to our research and development work in the long run. In order to fight climate disruption and to protect biodiversity. And the third line of action is uh, uh, sustainable development. We want to develop the well being within the company and we want to give our, our workers a healthy and safe and secure work environment. We take all the necessary measures to reach that goal. Now I'll move on to slide number eight, just to show you, to give you an overview of the European clients we have nowadays, those who trust us, mainly large distributors in France. We have Carrefour, Leclerc, Auchan, the Casino Group, 
le U, Lidl, Intermarché, in France, the Belgians, the Germans and the Dutch are present, Colroyd, Aldi, um, Haik, R-E-W-E. Oui. We have one minute left. I'm only going to give you an overview of the market trends that we've with, witnessed during these last two years. This summarizes the major trends that have been mentioned before. Um, we have been faced with an unprecedented health uh, situation that totally changed the way of consuming fruit and vegetables. We have witnessed the strengthening of local consumption and we've seen the need to rise to differentiate and justify responsible purchases. So first, it's important, but it, it has um, enhanced the importance of logos and labels on the products. And for those who have the capacity to propose healthy and natural products, there are major opportunities. And the consumers ask a growing transparency about the supply chain and the production modes. And as a conclusion, I'd only say that our key success factors, there are four of them. They are, on the one hand, are belonging to a solid group, um, responsible agricultural supply chain, our regular investments in our production tools and our in innovative practices and sustainable development, which is really in our ADN. As to our future projects, we want to broaden the range of products we offer. Um, I mean, healthy products, organic, um, grown with less pesticides. And we also want to strengthen responsible production modes in agriculture and in the industry by limiting our, our consumption of resources. So I come to the end of my presentation. I hope I didn't speak for too long. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Oh. You have some questions actually. One is the seed companies. I mean, if you are working with seed companies to leverage host resistance with new varieties. Uh, so, without a major delay, uh, Timothy Pellissier. Tim Timothy Pellissier is the sales and marketing director of CFAO Retail Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, so, he is a um, uh, retail Carrefour uh, since 2018. It's based in Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, he has uh, big dossiers on his plate, but among others, the creation and management of the commercial structure, the strategy, purchasing, recruitment, training, etc., as well as the multifunctional projects like uh, legal logistics and IT. So thank you very much for being with us and for bringing the, 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 another perspective uh, uh, after Madagascar from uh, Côte d'Ivoire and the retail uh, group uh, tendencies there and trends. Thank you. You don't have a PowerPoint, so it will be some speaking points. No, je n'ai pas de PowerPoint. Bonjour à tous. No, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. Good morning to you all. I apologize for not having a PowerPoint or any um, written presentation. But at the beginning of the school year, we have so little time for us. I am now in, well, I've been in Côte d'Ivoire for a few years already for the CFAO group which is in a joint venture with Carrefour. Our main project, the main project of this joint venture and this adventure is to get the Carrefour franchise for Côte d'Ivoire, Cameroon and Senegal in Western Africa. So CFAO has the franchise, which allows us to have in Côte d'Ivoire five Carrefour shops that can bear the name Carrefour and three shops very soon of the Subeco brand, which belongs to Carrefour, but it, these are more discount shops. And in the forthcoming years, we plan to open five shops, uh, five stores a year in Abidjan, but we've also worked inside the country to be able to offer, I what we call the mo modern distribution. The Ivorian market today, 
and among others, the, uh, the local market, um, at the local level, the informal market um, are really is are really strong, and the main stakeholders of distribution of retail are Carrefour and Casino. On the whole, there are a few other brands, but on the whole, these are the main names: Carrefour and CFAO have um, started offering Ivorians certain um, products they would like to have, they want to have, uh, and they want to find in a safe, air-conditioned, modern environment. So they want to be able to find there the fruit and vegetable they can buy from street markets. The challenge for CFAO today is to offer that emerging middle class access to local fruit and veg and local produce in a more modern setting with more uh, health safety, with more transparency about prices, more transparency about quality. So nowadays, Carrefour is really um, working very closely with its local providers. Um, uh, when I arrived in uh, the, uh, Côte d'Ivoire, I really worked in order to develop um, a specific relationship with the local producers. Well, there are big companies uh, such as L'Oréal, Coca-Cola, these companies are apart from the rest, in our opinion. We're talking about local producers and local processors. Um, of fruit and veg, and those who are responsible for processing these products so they can be sold in our stores. The fruit and veg, veg uh, market when we arrived here was very complex because we had multiple contacts, but we found it very difficult to structure the relationship with the providers, with the suppliers, because they were very, very small and they didn't know the world of mass retail. So we talked with a few NGOs and we uh, trained them. We explained how they could sell their produce um, through mass retail in our stores. Um, I'm hard, I'm tough when I, I negotiate, but I'm really trying not to be tough with those suppliers. We don't, our goal is not to have low um, wholesale prices and huge profit. Our goal is to attract them to us so they can offer their produce, whether processed or not. And we want to make sure that our customers can um, meet them, can get in touch with them. So we've had in August an operation that highlighted all the local produce, uh, food and non-food, fresh or processed. In all the departments, the local products were really made more visible. We, ha we worked in partnership with a few NGOs, with the Chamber of Agriculture of Côte d'Ivoire and other partners, also schools. Two months ago, I um, took part in a project that uh, helped uh, entrepreneurs come and show their project so, so they could be granted uh, 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 grants, grants, subsidies. The idea was to really enhance the value and uh, um, better display the local produce. Well, our customers uh, demand quality. We worked with a supplier who had the organic certification, the EcoCell label. So that supplier was very successful in our, sh in our stores uh, because our customers were really interested. There was a demand. We, we wanted that producer to come to us every week with the available produce he has. 
we didn't want to push him to increase production and lose his values. Um, and of course, this pro the, the organic produce is more expensive, but they were really uh, very successful because the Ivorian population is asking for quality, needs quality. They want quality and the higher income customers are prepared to pay the price for organic produce. So we're really trying to develop those partnerships as much as we can. And we try to support our partners and respect them. And every month we find new suppliers. Um, they supply uh, honey, uh, processed coconut, a chicken, uh, processed banana, but also fresh fruit and veg. And that really enables us to um, enhance the value um, of Ivorian culture and Western African culture. So without more delay again, we are now with our last speaker from the private sector part, uh, Jeff Maintach. I hope I pronounce well, sorry. Tash, okay. Director, Fruit and Vegetable, Flower and Plant Sectors, you cooperative in France, very known. You're an agronomist by training, very long experience, more than 28 years in the large-scale distribution as well, in different groups like Auchan, Casino, Géant, and so on, uh, before moving to the fruit and vegetable purchasing. Um, and you have a lot of experience, not only in the markets in France, but overseas, uh, notably Southeast Asia. So thank you very much uh, for a brief uh, insight from your side. Merci Isolina, je vais essayer de faire rapidement pour ne pas faire attendre plus puisqu'il y en a certains. Thank you Isolina, I'll try to be quick in order not to make people wait for too long because some people are very hungry and I am particularly aware of the presence of our Fiji friends. Um, in Fiji it must be about 10 o'clock at night. Voilà. Donc, vous allez voir, effectivement, il y a un certain nombre de choses. Je vais... There, I'm going to skip certain things. Uh, there have been many participants and many people have spoken before me to explain a number of things. First of all, when we speak about what we call GMS, that is the mass retail or mass distribution, we speak about stores that have a surface of between 400 square meters and 1,000 square meters. Then there are different categories. We have the large stores, the grand magasin, department stores, which average surface is 5,200 square meters. They have between 50 and 80,000 products, different references in food and non-food. Then we have average surfaces between 400 and um, 2,050. The average is 1,250 square meters. Um, And these are have between five and 10,000 references with the exception of Aldi and Lidl where they have around 1,000 references. We represent about 70% of the food consumption market. I'm not going to say any more. We are major stakeholders in France and particularly in the fruit and veg industry. Hubertus has focused on the evolution of the price of fruit and veg. You can see here that there is growth of the average sales price and in green you have the evolution of volumes. The market is still very promising in terms of volumes, in terms of turnover. In 2020 there has been a strong growth in volume and of course the lockdown in France has played a role. Among all the households, the food consumption, uh, eight, 18 or 19 percent is, um, is the consumption on the fruit and veg market. It represents more than 38 billion euros. I'm not going to, to, co to go back to what Emmanuel Berbourcelet said when he said that fruit and veg were on the rise. Uh, I just would like to say that 36 percent of bulk sales in department larger stores are fruit 
and veg. So we are in a very promising market, market with lots of opportunities, um, given the change in consumption habits and the changes in the views of the customers. Another point that has been mentioned is the consumption of organic produce. You're not going to see the legend, but the caption, but this represents the GMS, the mass retail share and the 716 million, we represent 34%. We're the second sales vector of organic fruit and veg on the French market. But the mass retailers do not only sell um, fresh fruit and veg, uh, we are also major stakeholders in processed products. The fruit and veg and fro well frozen products. 86% of tinned uh, preserved vegetables are bought um, in our stores, it, respectively 86 and 51%. What you're most interested in is this part, the expectations of French consumers. French consumers will tend to say, I want local produce from France, preferably, uh, and environmentally friendly products. So if we spontaneously ask the customers the following question, uh, for example, should we buy responsibly? In, in which industry? And 79% say that responsible purchasing should especially be in the food sector. And 67% say, say it spontaneously without being asked a question. The COVID effect has turned customers, has pushed customers to focus much more on French produce and local produce. The French market, many people might tend to say, well, the French market is over, it's closed, there's no opportunities. Well, far removed from it. When we ask the consumers what the most important thing is for us, the first most important thing is the price. So the environmental impact is on, on this only comes six and the geographic origin only four. So there is a, a true market. There are cards to play in the among the actors you represent. And these cards are the taste quality if you want to get into the French market, you should be good in prices and good in taste quality. People tend to say that price is the only uh, negotiation factor of mass retail. Well, quality is also a negotiation factor because we need quality produce, whether they come from outside or from France. Now, the last point that everybody has pointed out is the safety, the quality in terms of uh, traceability, the traceability that guarantees the safety and something uh, sustainable for our consumers. So what are the uh, challenges uh, for mass retail in the future? We first have to uh, maintain that uh, the uh, fruit and vegetable, fresh fruit and vegetable consumption. In the last uh, few years, uh, prices have gone up 27%, which has got a strong impact on consumption. We have to go on strongly promoting fruit and vegetable in terms of uh, consumption and branding in order for consumers to go on buying fresh uh, fruit and vegetable. The uh, second challenge, as uh, some have already said, is uh, the need to, to tighten the link between upstream and downstream. Uh, during COVID, uh, we've seen a genuine partnership uh, concluded with uh, producers and those were more uh, well off than uh, those without contracts. And we should we could then uh, set up a multi-annual uh, partnership contracts or uh, non-fixed uh, term contracts that would be automatically renewed. So these are um, elements that we are contemplating right now. And the last uh, challenge, which has got a strong impact, uh, um, is uh, concerning the new generations, the future generations, which will become uh, tomorrow's uh, consumers, is what will our environmental impact be? We'll have to limit uh, that uh, footprint and that impact. We have to uh, cut down on plastic uh, uh, packaging. Uh, um, we also 
uh, should try to get local supply. I uh, do not think we will uh, be able to uh, uh, grow banana, pineapple or mango uh, locally in the near future. So that market remains uh, uh, there. We have to adopt a respectful, uh, environmentally friendly uh, practices and abide by the new standards. One is being drafted right now and will aim at explaining uh, customers that the products that they are buying has uh, been environmentally friendly produced and um, processed possibly. And we'll have to um, increase uh, the uh, supply of uh, products uh, that are uh, environmental friendly. So that was uh, very quickly. I try to stick to the timetable, uh, Isolina. So there are many questions that have been answered, many uh, uh, inputs as well in terms of wanting to connect with OECD, co-ACP and partners, especially on specific support. So those, I see that my colleagues, thank you very much, have been already answering those and please keep uh, connecting with us. Uh, we are really taken by time. So the only thing I can do is to give one minute uh, to each uh, speaker really uh, or less. To, uh, one uh, actually uh, question remaining about the access to research and trends and market opportunities, which is key. The private sector part, uh, a few questions are about technology and especially technology transfer, something that goes from post-harvest to you know, technologies on conservation to refrigeration, including solar refrigeration and so on. And of course, the opportunities to those markets for uh, Southern operators, especially uh, I saw many messages from Africa, but not only because in, indeed we have Caribbean and Pacific participants too. So if any of you uh, want to start, uh, I don't know, Frederic, uh, uh, of course you are all a big innovators. So that, that is the, uh, that is the question, but something that could be, you see in the coming uh, years, but that could be also of interest to our Southern community. Yeah, well, that's uh, <laughs> strangely and coincidentally, yesterday we had a strategic workshop within our company on, on sourcing and, and, and the effects on sustainable farming. And, and one of the main conclusions there, and I think this will be a, a work for the coming decade, basically, is, is really, okay, how can we reinforce and where should we reinforce uh, let's say, or support to uh, to farmers in terms of, of training and, and technical support, not not necessarily by employees of us, but, but in cooperation with, uh, with parties like ODCP and, and others. And uh, definitely we see a trend, and it was mentioned also by the last speaker, in terms of uh, more sustainable farming methods, not necessarily organic, because there is a tipping point there, which organic, we see there the 10%, Going above that will be difficult at, at, uh, at these price levels, but in terms of agroecology, whether then that's regenerative farming or others, there's a lot of, of questions out there. There's no one uh, no one straight answer. Uh, and I think there uh, we owe it to ourselves, but also in, in a broader coalition to see, okay, how can we help uh, our growers to move in that uh, if the societal demand is there, then okay, we should be assisting also uh, growers uh, which which need our help because def definitely there will be big growers which don't need uh, the help, uh, but where we can uh, uh, help them at, at best and with which partners. Thank you very much. Someone wants to come in. Uh, uh, Emmanuel, Jeremy, on the of course, Colacp is also very much uh, you know uh, uh, requested on the support to innovations. Uh, many of my colleagues are working, uh, as Frederica said, in uh, transitioning towards you know for those who are not more sustainable practices as well, which implies innovations, obviously, very much to the field and kind of agroecological and other sustainable practices. Uh, Jeremy, you want to add uh, uh, something there? Mm -hmm. Maybe very quickly, Isolina, because of the time constraints, but to, to bounce back on, on maybe Frederick's comments, clearly it, on, on our side, it, it's, it's a major challenge. I mean, we're, we're seeing this move and uh, we're seeing it, we saw it a couple of ten, 10 years ago, but more from, from a market perspective with a number of certifications starting to include uh, some, some new types of demands on how food was being produced. We, 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 we through our, one of our programs, now the, the philosophy is to try to move beyond strictly what is what is directly required through certification. We, we realize now that we need to go one step beyond. And one crucial element uh, when it comes, of course, to sustainability, we always talk about the, the, the environmental side, but 
we, we need to build from the start the business case from, a, from, from the production perspective at, at, at MSME level. That without the building of that business case, the the other two pillars of the sustainability uh, will be will be will be in, put in je into jeopardy on, on on the social and environmental fronts, and 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 that's it. That's true, of course, all over the world. But um, of course, the, the, the potential impacts on, on on livelihoods could be demultiplied in 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 contexts uh, in 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 LDCs and, and and emerging economies, and 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 that's our challenge today: is to progressively transition towards, of course, overall more sustainable practices while building up the competitiveness, as highlighted by uh, by Philippe. Um, and and yeah, competitiveness through through sustainability. It's, it's a nice, nice slogan, but, it, but it's extremely challenging and, and it will take time. It will take a lot of investment uh, and, and not only, of course, on, 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 on the harder uh, equipment infrastructure, uh, but, but on, the, on the human capital side at all levels of the value chains. Uh, so, so there's a need, of course, to link more with academia, with research, more, more collective uh, and, and smart uh, uh, collaborations. Within within sectors, between companies, between companies, BMOs with public authorities. So it's a, it requires really a collective approach, given the scale and the nature of the challenge. Again, uh, on, on this environmental side, um, and, and it's maybe something that that also ourselves as an association, it's something that we need to bring forward and put forward more strongly, as 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 the illustration from Frederick with the inverted pyramid. Uh, they, they, they linked to the climate urgency, uh, fruit and veg can be part of the answer. Uh, of course, uh, given, given that uh, production practices don't go into deforestation and, and a number of other uh, uh, bad practices with, well, with practices with a, a, a bad impact on, uh, on, on, on climate change, but, but they can clearly be a, 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 a part, part of the solution. So, so that, thank you, Isabel. Yeah, thank That's you very be... much and for not being shy in highlighting that is tough work as well. Huh? I mean, it, it's a lot of work from the operators as well to uh, transition there. Uh, Jose, uh, who works with Marie on OECD and hasn't uh, spoken quickly, you have raised your hand. And the others, please raise your hand if you have a, a, a quick comment to make before we uh, close. Jose? Yes. Hi, Solina. Well, I want to thank all the panelists for the very good discussions. Uh, I just have one point to close, I mean, on we the side of OECD. You. We can't see you in case. Okay, so now you can see, sorry. So I just have one point that I would like to, to highlight to close on the side of OECD, and that's uh, on the importance of marketing standards. Marketing standards, if you know them, they can be a very powerful tool for trade. If you don't know how to use or apply marketing standards, well, that can be a barrier to trade. Marketing standards are linked to quality. And as you know, quality is linked to price. So uh, that's a very good point for, for producers and traders to know. There was one very interesting question about uh, how uh, products are prioritized when developing a standard. That's totally market driven. So the more uh, governments and, and markets start seeing a product that enters their, their market, they will ask to develop a standard. Why to develop a standard? Well, to regulate trade. They want that everybody knows from the farmer to the trader, to the consumer, to the inspectors of the governments who check uh, the quality of the product to know exactly what they need to check. So this, as I was telling, if you know how this works, it will help you. It's a, it's a tool that can help you open markets. Uh, if you don't know, I mean, that can create more trouble. Uh, there was a question on how they can participate I mean, you know, with OECD and uh, with our work. Very quickly, uh, my colleague already answered, we work with governments, with institutions. We work with uh, traders associations or, or, or other organizations like Colia CP that uh, regroup a lot of, of farmers, traders, and producers. Uh, particular traders, I mean, uh, private traders, they can approach their governments. They can approach their national or international organizations. Uh, and then they can approach us. I mean, we try to work with all stakeholders. It's in everybody's interest that everybody knows the marketing standards, how they work, and uh, how to improve trade between all our member countries. So with this, I close my intervention. Thank you very much. And thanks to all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose, and uh, to your uh, colleagues uh, as well. I think we have done quite a lot of information for the first session. As I said, we will go deep into uh, other 
uh, other questions in the coming session. So thank you very much to all of you. Uh, if anybody wants still to raise, if not, we have, uh, you know, uh, replacing Estipion who was in the program, Yvonne, Yvonne Chileche in Brussels, but uh, with a big mandate, which is uh, representing and serving the African, Caribbean and Pacific states through the Secretariat OECPS uh, in English, which is a, a very uh, big number, um, which at ECP we are very happy to serve as well. She is a long-standing expert on trade uh, and uh, we, uh, managing programs, which are, of course, very wide and very useful from the small scale farmers to, of course, big companies uh, in local regional market as well as export market. So thank you very much, despite being in a committee of ambassadors currently now, uh, to step just out to give some of you uh, insights on what has been said from your perspective. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you very much, uh, Isolina, and good afternoon to you all. Good morning, good evening. I mean, we'll always do anything for CoLACP. You know that you are special to us. So as uh, Isolina mentioned, uh, we'd like to apologize on behalf of the Assistant Secretary General, who unfortunately has to be in the other meeting. I also want to take uh, uh, this opportunity to thank CoLACP and OECD for organizing these important online series of discussions, uh, which are in the context of the 2021 International Year of Fruits and Vegetables. I also want to thank uh, all the presenters and participants for their contribution, which has made this meeting to actually be very fruitful. For us as uh, OACPS, we are delighted to be here and to be included in this conversation. Um, we believe that uh, this discussion is actually timely, um, especially since most of our countries are in the process of uh, building back better following the COVID-19 pandemic. So the information that has been presented today, I think is very, very valuable and will go a long way in assisting um, institutions like us who are policy makers. Um, we noted that uh, the presentations gave us um, a very comprehensive overview of the sector. I mean, um, what could be better than getting first-hand information from the actors in the sector? I mean, we, we got presentations from the different actors and associations, and we really appreciated that. But what we noted is also that uh, we, we, we took note of the market trends, uh, the importance of the sector for private sector development, um, the future perspectives, which points are seeing um, growth in uh, consumer spending on fruit and vegetables. We also noted the positive impact um, that the sector has on health and nutrition uh, with the emphasis on healthier and sustainable diets. I must dig digress here a bit. I am a culprit of uh, smoothies, especially smoothies made by bananas. So very happy with that. Then of course, we had information regarding the impact of uh, COVID-19, both positive and negative. I think uh, from one of the presentation, we noted that in terms of the negative impact, um, it uh, contributed to the restriction in movement, which affected the, the sector negatively. But on the positive side, we noted that um, they, because of this, uh, because of COVID, there are new consumer patterns which are now focusing on consumption of fruits and vegetables. Now, on the policy aspects, I was able to deduce five points from the, dis from the discussions. And these five points actually relate to what we are currently uh, working on um, in collaboration with the European Union. Uh, we do have what we call a joint EU OACPS uh, private sector development framework, where we basically implement a number of uh, programs and I'll, I'll, I'll shed a bit of light. I, I'll speak about three of them later on. So from the discussions, we noted five points, as I mentioned. The first point related to the competitiveness of the fruit and vegetable sector. We have noted that it is important to continue supporting the private sector. Um, it is important to capacitate um, member states, uh, OACP member states, to be able to put in place policies and regulations that will create a conducive environment. Some of the themes that we picked up uh, included the issue of capacity building, the issue of ensuring there's techno 
technology transfer, innovation, facilitating access to finance so that um, the sector is able to grow. We also observe that um, since we are speaking about trade, I think this aspect is very, very important. I mean, we need to capacitate our suppliers so that they have a product which they can take to the market. I mean, you can have market access, but if you don't have a product which you can take, which is of good quality, you know, and which has got sustainable uh, supply, it doesn't really help a country. So for us, this is very, very important. And uh, we will continue supporting our member states in this area. The second uh, area that we picked uh, relates to trade facilitation. And here, basically, I think it's uh, basically to ensure that there's a, a smooth flow of uh, products, uh, ensuring that we reduce the thickness of borders. But here, what was also interesting, we took note of the OECD fruit and vegetable scheme, which basically emphasizes on the importance of market standards and how it's important to harmonize uh, these standards. The third area relates to market access. Um, here again, uh, there was a lot of discussion uh, relating to different regulations that are coming out of the EU. Uh, for instance, the organic regulations, the issues to do with pesticides, uh, SPS issues, but also um, I think as Jeremy mentioned, these issues that are coming up uh, related to the sustainability agenda, where basically we are looking at sustainability from three angles, environment, social, and economic. But I think the idea from our side is that we want to ensure that this agenda does not actually become a barrier to trade. And that is why it's very, very important for us to support our members uh, to put in place um, mechanisms that will be able to, for instance, um, be able to show that uh, when a product is produced, uh, there was no child labor involved or it does not actually contribute to deforestation. I think another important element here is the issue of transparency and traceability and how it can contribute to the growth of the sector. Research was another common theme that came out and we believe that research, yes, is very, very important, especially if we're going to talk about informed policies uh, that have to be developed by our countries. Uh, we last the last point I noted was on smart collaborations. I think this was uh, emphasized on the need to ensure that there's collaboration between the public and private sector to ensure that policies developed respond to the needs of the sector. Those were the five points that we took note. And just to uh, finish off, um, as I mentioned, um, the OACPS works closely with the EU. Um, our relationship is actually governed by um, a partnership agreement. We actually just initialed a new agreement which is going to run for the next 20 years. But before that, I'm sure some of you may be familiar with the Cotonou Partnership Agreement, which was governing our relationship. And it's under this agreement where we have this joint uh, ACP EU private sector development framework. And under this framework, we are implementing a number of programs just to highlight three programs that relate to fruit and vegetable. So we have what we call the fruit uh, feed for market program, which is being implemented by uh, Cole SAP. Um, the first uh, program was um, implemented in 2016. Um, and then we had another one, uh, which was implemented in 2018, which was now focused on SPS issues. We are currently in the process of uh, finalizing a third action, and we foresee that the third action, the third program will actually um, have more emphasis on the issues of sustainability. We also have another program, Technical Barriers to Trade, uh, which we're implementing with UNIDO. And here again is to make sure that um, standards are harmonized and they do not um, become non-tariff barriers. Then the last program I want to speak about is the framework program on agricultural value chains, which is basically focusing on empowering actors uh, along the value chains. Um, basically, it tries to promote uh, value addition by building capacities and um, facilitating trade uh, between OACPS countries within the region and at the international level. 
all this information, if required, we can provide you with a link where you'll find all the programs that we are implementing. So I will stop here. And I think what is left for me is just to thank everyone for your contributions, which have made this meeting very, very uh, successful for us. And um, we also want to thank uh, Cole SAP and OEC for inviting us to participate uh, in these discussions. We look forward to the next session. Thank you very much and have a lovely day. Thank you very much, Yvonne, for a very, an excellent summary uh, of the key points. I mean, and very, very comprehensive and holistic, holistic. So thank you very much to everybody. Does anybody want still to say something, Jeremy? Nobody? No? We say bye-bye, bon appétit, eat fruit and vegetables please <laughs> and uh, yes in whichever whatever form as frederick and others have shown you i have enjoyed very, very much uh, you know uh, the research uh, uh, the policy and as well the big operators i mean uh, from which we have uh, many lessons to learn that came despite a very 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 tough uh, schedule for them so that is very very appreciated thank you to all and we keep in thank touch you. yes you will have all the presentations etc etc bye Keep Bye -bye. well and safe. Thank you, Isolina. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Isolina. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.